All right, our discussion on special provisions and special rights being given to private equity and venture capital investors um, continues. And in the last uh, video, we saw how uh, investors can protect their investments through anti-dilution clauses, uh, how promoters can protect the, 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 the shares of the company from falling into wrong hands through rights of first offer and right of first refusal. We've also talked about um, tag and drag, right? The only two uh, major kinds of clauses that are left in our discussion are exit rights and preferred payouts on liquidation. So let's take a look at exit choices that um, are exit options that a investor may have. We've already talked about a third party sale, which might be subject to share transfer restrictions, such as the row for the row for. Um, let's talk about the buyback and put option. Now, upon the happening of a particular event, or upon the choice of the investor, the investor may choose to force the company to buy back the shares or force the promoter to buy out the company, right? So that's your buyback and, and put option. So as far as the investor is concerned, the buyback and the put option, they are more or less the same because they both give the investor an exit. From the company's perspective, however, um, a buyback is very different from a put option. A buyback by a company can only be done under certain conditions. Uh, I believe that you require a special resolution. And the funds for the buyback can only come out of particular accounts. For a put option, however, the company really doesn't care because um, the promoter is the one that is under the that uh, is obligated under the put option. So while buybacks and put options by themselves aren't a problem. The moment you start putting in clauses, buybacks, or clauses on buybacks and put options with assured returns, so for guaranteed rate of returns, then starts the problem. The problem is then, well, what it seems like is a debt investment, right? For example, the investor has invested, uh, let's say, 100 rupees into the company with a buyback or a put option at 1.2 times, right? Which means that when the investor is exercising its put option or buyback option, then the investor will get back its entire investment plus 20%, right? Which seems to me that these would be akin to debt investments. And then that would mean that the investor isn't really participating in the equity risk of the company, right? Of course, we'll talk about the last option as well, the qualified initial public offering, but that comes at the end. So let's take a look at buybacks and put options. Um, now, we know for a fact the problem with um, having an assured return on an equity in instrument, you know, effectively means that it's no longer an equity instrument. It's a debt instrument, right? One of the key factors or, or the key features of an equity investment is that you share in the risk and you share in the return as well. Now, this matter was brought to light in two recent cases, Cruise City versus Unitech and Entity Docomo versus Tata. In both cases, um, the investee company, Unitech and Tata, um, failed to meet certain performance standards or certain performance um, milestones. Unitech failed to meet, um, like all real estate developers do, Unitech failed to meet um, certain construction timelines and Tata, um, Tata Docomo um, couldn't meet certain, uh, certain profitability guidelines or milestones thanks to GEO. In both cases, um, the investor, Cruise City and NTT Docomo, in both cases, these guys, the, in, the investors, had put options with assured returns, right? The Delhi High Court um, held, very surprising, in, in my view, very surprisingly, held that while the investor will not be assured, cannot be assured a guaranteed return, but can be entitled to damages in case of breach of the shareholders agreement. Let's take a moment to understand what this means. The Delhi High Court is of the opinion that even though you have a put option with an assured return, assured rate of return, that will not be allowed in case you are a non-resident investor. In both of these situations, Entity Docomo being Japanese, Cruise City being, being, being from Mauritius, they are both non-resident investors. What the Delhi High Court is saying is that we will not be able to give you a guaranteed return but because the shareholders agreement or the articles of, of association have been breached, you are entitled to compensation. And what is the measure of that compensation? 
the same amount that you would have received had you had a guaranteed rate of return, right? So effectively, what the Delhi High Court is doing is it's upholding the guaranteed, it's upholding the enforceability of a guaranteed rate of return, not in letter, but in spirit, right? So post Unitech and post Tata Docomo, what we're beginning to see is clauses in the articles or the SHA saying that in case a guaranteed rate of return is not uh, available, right, in case it is against, you know, extant law for a guaranteed rate of return, then the promoter or the company will have to pay damages um, we'll have to pay damages to the extent of that additional guaranteed rate of return, right? So when I am exercising a put option, if I'm a non-resident investor, when I'm exercising a put option under FEMA guidelines, I can only sell back my shares at a particular price. But we have agreed on a different price earlier on with our guaranteed rate of return. So let's say under FEMA guidelines, um, I am entitled to, re to receive through the put option. I am entitled to receive, let's say, 100 rupees. But we had agreed upon 140 rupees to be returned to me under the contract, under the SHA, right? The additional 40 rupees is going to be returned to me via damages, right? Now, again, I find this to be a rather, you know, a, a, a bit of a circumvention of the law. And in my view, of course, that, and again, feel free, feel free to, to disagree. Uh, in my view, this does not meet the spirit of the law, right? Where the idea behind having, um, the idea be be behind prohibiting a guaranteed rate of return is that when a, a non-resident investor is investing in equity instruments, they should also share in the risk of investing in a company, right? All right, let's take a look at a qualified IPO. Now, we know what an IPO is. It is a process by which a private company turns public and lists itself on the stock exchange, right? Now, a typical, now we know for a fact that most private equity investors would like to exit by way of an IPO. This is the preferred um, sort of strategy to exit. Of course, not all private equity investors or venture capital investors will be able to exit by way of an IPO. They might sell out their shares to a second or a third round investor, right? Now, the qualified IPO clause is typically a fairly long one. And these are the ingredients that go into the IPO, into the qualified IPO clause. First, that the investor shall have the first right to sell its shares in the IPO. So when a company is going public, under ICDR, the SEBI Issue of Capital and Disclosure Requirements Regulation 2009, um, the company is required to sell a minimum number of shares, right? Or uh, a minimum amount of money has to be sort of mopped up by the IPO, right? The, um, the IPO clause, the, the, the qualified IPO clause will say that the investor shall have the right to sell its shares in the IPO before anybody else, right? That's one. Second, the right not to be named as a promoter. We'll come back to this later. Third, if I have any shares within the IPO, uh, if I have any shares post the IPO, that my shares will not be locked in. Um, fourth, that there can, should not be an IPO, that we cannot talk about an IPO unless all of my shares, I, and unless I can sell all of my shares, right? Fifth, that the investor shall have a say or, you know, shall it shall be at the discretion of the investor to, um, you know, have a say in, in let's say, pre preparation of the offer document, in this case, the red heading prospectus, in deciding which stock exchanges to list on uh, in, in, in matters that, uh, that have to do with who are we engaging as our merchant bankers or our auditors and the capital markets lawyers. Now, this in my view, is a bit of a problem because let's start with promoters, right? A promoter is defined as somebody who has control over the affairs of the issuer, the company, directly or indirectly, whether as shareholder, director or otherwise, right? Now, while we are saying that the investor shall have the right not to be named as promoter, but the investor already has a number of rights, including the right to appoint directors, quorum rights and affirmative voting rights. Now, there, there seems to be some element of control 
that the investor will have over the management and policy decisions of the company, right? So, for example, change of business is a policy decision which cannot be taken without the approval of the investor. Now, does this mean that the investor has control over the company? Well, this, so really, the, 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 the question that we are asking is, if we have a qualified IPO clause and the investor has all these rights apart from uh, the right to appoint directors, quorum rights and affirmative voting rights, does that mean that investors have control over the company, right? There were two cases that came up. Um, the first one was Shubkam Ventures. Um, the Securities Appellate Tribunal held that if an investor has been given these rights, um, you know, board rights, quorum rights, affirmative voting rights, so on and so forth, they are not, they don't um, constitute control as such, but that these rights were given to the investor to protect the investors, right? The, to protect the investor's position in the company, right? Now, we, a lot of us, when Shubkam came out with this, with this, uh, with this order, um, when the SAT came out with this order, sorry, in the matter of Shubkam, we were all very excited because uh, there was a large section of um, corporate law scholars and um, others who were expecting uh, either the SAT or the Supreme Court to say that, no, this amounts to control. In fact, there's been plenty of literature on this, right? But when the matter went to the Supreme Court, very, very strangely, the Supreme Court dismissed the appeal, upheld, first upheld the order of the SAT, one. Second, it said that the order of the SAT in the matter of Shubkam Ventures would not be used as a precedent. And third, that the matter of or the question of what amounts to control in a company shall be left open-ended, right? Think about it. The Supreme Court is saying that while this SAT order is perfectly fine, we're dismissing the appeal against the SAT order, but it will not have any precedential value, one. Second, the question of control shall be left open-ended, right? Post should come, and that to us was a huge disappointment because we were looking to the apex court of the country for some kind of clarity on what constitutes control. Because right now what's happening is, you, while it's easy to say that if you have 51% shareholding in a company, you have control, right? But, and therefore you are by definition a promoter, right? But at 26%, you have some element of control. Add to that the right to appoint directors, the right to um, appoint advisors in an IPO, the right to, um, you know, to stop shareholder meetings or board meetings for lack of quorum, the right to assert your affirmative voting rights, etc. All of these for a lot of us amounts to control or some element of control. However, the Apex Court disappointed us by saying that, no, we will not, we will not enter into, we will not address this, this question at all, right? Um, Following up with Shubkam, um, in the matter of Kamath Hotels, again, the SEBI um, said that these, coven these, co these covenants, these rights are more in the nature of protective rights rather than policies under which to run the company. Now, the, uh, the stand taken by SEBI is, is obviously a stand that, that helps investors, right? And it's, it's, um, it's easy to see why SEBI would want to take that stand. If SEBI were to go the other way, if SEBI were to say, okay, affirmative voting rights, board rights, quorum rights, all of these amount to control, then you would see a slowdown in the private equity and venture capital space um, and in terms of the larger financial industry, right? Which means that in order to appease the private equity and venture capital industry, SEBI will have, um, will have to sh say that these are more along the lines of protective rights rather than policies to which, under which to run the company. SEBI takes it a step further to say, to say that these are mostly negative in nature. These rights are mostly negative in nature. Like you cannot hold a board meeting without me. You cannot take this decision without my consent. Right. So as opposed to a proactive nature of control where a, a company or the majority shareholder can propose a decision to be taken or a step to be taken, which must be met with the affirmative consent of the investor. In other words, what Sebi is trying to say is that the these affirmative voting rights or quorum rights, these point to a more 
passive role that the investor plays rather than the active role that a promoter in control plays, right? All right, in terms of pricing, and there are often um, sub-clauses within the Quipo clause saying that the investor will decide the price. Now, under, again, under the ICDR, the pricing in an IPO is decided by the company in consultation with the lead manager or the merchant bankers, right? The investor that itself does not have any statutory authority or uh, any obligation to affect the pricing of the IPO. However, because the IPO is again subject to a special resolution, right, under 621C, if there is a, uh, an IPO happening, the investor may simply not consent to that IPO until, um, you know, the, until everyone agrees to that particular price. Now, here's the problem. Here's going to be a tussle between the merchant bankers and the investor. So, in order to maximize returns from its investment, the investor will want uh, the highest possible price. On the other hand, merchant bankers who are tasked with the job of selling these shares to the public market will want to bring the prices down as much as possible, will want to underprice these shares. Why? Because if in case the in case all the shares are not sold through the IPO, the underwriting obligations of these merchant bankers will kick in. Therefore, there is a tussle between the investor on one hand and merchant bankers um, or the lead managers on the other hand. In which case, um, the you know we'll have to figure out who is going to win first, right? All right. So, in terms of qualified IPO pricing, there seems to be while there doesn't seem to be a statutory enforceability by the very nature of a further issue of shares, which is either which either will require a special resolution or will be subject to an affirmative vote by the investor. The investor will have some say in matters of pricing, right? All right. Lastly, let's come to payout on liquidation. Now, uh, I want to make a, a distinction here between something called a liquidity event and liquidation preference, right? So a liquidity event can be defined as pretty much anything, right? In case of a joint venture company, it could be the operational, the date on which the company commences operations. It could be the happening of any other particular event. However, liquidation preference is the preference that the investor gets or the advantage that the, that the investor gets in the event of the bankruptcy or insolvency or liquidation of the company, right? In effect, if the if the investor has equity shares, it's saying that it will be paid off before anybody else, right? Now, clearly, this is not enforceable, right? The Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code very clearly says, uh, puts forward an order of priority, right? In which equity shareholders are at the bottom, right? Um, in which case, if there is a clause that says, that in case of liquidation, in case of insolvency, in case of bankruptcy, the investor will be paid off first, that clause is going to be unceremoniously defenestrated. In other words, it's going to be thrown out of the window. Um, a preferred payout on, on, on liquidation is clearly unenforceable. Um, specifically under the, the insolvency and bankruptcy code, any contractual arrangement which disrupts this order of priority will be disregarded by the liquidator, right? I think that's the end of this um, this um, part of our discussion. Of course, we will have we will discuss this in more detail in our um, in our tutorials, right? Okay.